Good evening. Can everyone hear me okay? We'll do another test when uh, Mr. Cowan gets up because he has a different kind of microphone. Welcome to the Hudson Library and Historical Society. We're pleased that you can join us this evening for this very special program. I just want to get a show of hands of how many people that this is their first time coming to the Hudson Library. Okay, just a few. And then, and welcome. And how many of you ha um, this is that are, live in Hudson? Okay, and how many of you live outside of Hudson? Okay, but like two thirds or something from Hudson. <laughs> just a few things. Um, I just wanted to point out that in addition to wonderful programs like this, we also have a full slate of adult programs and children's programs and teen programs going on. Um, we were just talking over here, we offer over 35 adult programs a month. So um, some of you may be interested at the back of the room, we have our brochure, some of our history programs. Um, coming up, uh, a program on the Rockefeller family and their connection to the Cleveland area. Um, as part of our American Heritage series, author Fred Kaplan will be coming to talk about John Quincy Adams. Um, author Logan Byrne will be coming um, to talk about George Washington. And then James Robbins will be talking about the real Custer um, from boy general to tragic hero. So all of those programs are free to you. And I would like to remind you that if you can donate to these programs, um, we do have a donation box at the back of the room. Um, and it really helps bring programs like this to you. I am pleased and honored to welcome Wes Cowan to the Hudson Library. He's an internationally recognized as expert in historic Americana. Um, he's licensed licensed as an auctioneer in Ohio and holds a BA and MA in anthropology from the University of Kentucky and a PhD in anthropology from the University of Michigan. Go blue. <laughs> but after receiving, I went to Michigan, after receiving his doctorate, he went to Ohio State and, <laughs> and taught at the anthropology department there. So I'm wondering, who you root for? We'll, we'll have to ask that at the question and answer. Um, in 1984, he moved to Cincinnati to assume the post of curator of archaeology at the Cincinnati Museum of Natural History. And in 1995, he la left academia and the museum world to return to his childhood love of antiques. He's the founder and owner of Cowan's Auctions, Inc. in Cincinnati. And he most recently opened up an office in Cleveland in, on in Warrensville Heights in June 2nd. So now you have two allegiances as well. You have the Cincinnati and the Cleveland. So I don't know, you're really all over with these sports teams here. Um, as long as you say you don't like the Steelers, we're okay. Um, <laughs> Cowan stars in, <laughs> stars in the PBS television series, History Detectives, and the featured appraiser on the Antiques Roadshow. Please give a warm welcome to Mr. Wes Cowan. Well, uh, I have to say um, thank you for having me first. This is my first trip to Hudson, Ohio. And uh, driving in from, uh, I'm staying in Chagrin Falls at the Chagrin Inn or something like that. And driving in, uh, I was struck by how beautiful this town is. Uh, and I'm sure I'm not telling you guys anything new, but it's just a gorgeous place. And um, a lot of northern Ohio is like that compared to southern Ohio. You know, we got the glaciers, and they flattened us out. The glaciers really sort of missed this area. So uh, it's great to see rolling hills, uh, great to see big, tree, big trees on your streets. It's typical uh, northern Ohio town, except better, right? Um, this library is a, um, for those of you who are here and you've been here before, it's pretty astounding for an Ohio town to have a, a resource like this. So um, it's a great resource. I'm sure you use it, um, use it more, um, and every librarian will love you if you do. I, I thought that what I would do tonight, um, and this is going to be sort of one of my typical canned uh, speeches, 
is to um, is to tell you a little bit about myself and then launch right into History Detectives and Antiques Roadshow. Uh, we'll talk about the antique market uh, a little bit and where it is today and where I, where I see it's going. And if I can get all that done in about 35 minutes, um, we'll have time for questions. And any question at the end of the uh, talk is game. You can talk to me. You can ask me about history detectives. You can ask me about the Antiques Roadshow. You can ask me about the auction business. Um, our inaugural Cleveland auction, uh, in fact, is this Saturday. Uh, we're on Miles Road, right down from the Miles Farmer Mar Farmer's Market. I don't know if anybody knows where that is, but uh, in Warrensville Heights. So, um, hope to see some of you guys there. Um, you know, I, I, I think that um, if you'd asked me 25 years ago, would I be doing what I do now? I'd say no. Um, I was an academic. Uh, I came into academia as a result of a childhood love of archaeology. Um, a neighbor of mine, when I was about nine years old, gave me an arrowhead. And uh, right then and there, I decided I was going to be an, an, uh, an archaeologist. Um, so I went to school uh, in high school and uh, was very interested, had a very indulging mother who would drive me around and before I got a driver's license to local archaeological sites and to the Louisville, uh, Kentucky Archaeological Society meetings. Um, I went to the University of Kentucky, um, got my BA and MA, uh, and then went to the University of Michigan for my PhD. Uh, I was one of those weird guys in uh, graduate school who had a subspecialty in anthropology uh, that was called paleoethnobotany. I was um, an anthropologist, an, an archaeologist, who was interested in the origins of food production. And I was specifically interested in the origins of food production in eastern North America. So um, that carried me through a number of years. Um, I did a lot of work uh, while I was at um, uh, Kentucky. Uh, in a part of eastern Kentucky called Red River Gorge, which is a, um, uh, an area that uh, is on the western edge of the Cumberland Plateau that's just pocked with caves and uh, rock overhangs where things that were people camped thousands of years ago became preserved uh, because of the dry atmosphere of these caves and overhangs. And lo and behold, among those caves were lots of plant remains. That's how I got interested in the origins of agriculture. When I moved to Cincinnati, I became very interested in the transition from um, foraging and food and incipient horticulture to maize agriculture. So I did a lot of work on uh, maize agriculture in the Ohio Valley. How in the world did I get away from that? And I was at the museum for 11 years. Uh, that's a good question. Well, like, uh, who here has an advanced degree? I would bet that there are going to be a number of people here who do. Anybody here have a PhD? A couple people have a PhD. Was there a time when you were writing your master's thesis or your PhD when you said, I don't want to write my master's thesis or my PhD anymore and I want to go do something else? Well, when I was at Michigan writing my PhD, uh, that's exactly what happened to me. I got bored of writing my dissertation and I started going to antique shops uh, in southeastern <laughs> Michigan. Uh, it's not that much of a stretch um, because I'd grown up in a house full of antiques. My mother was a collector. Uh, I used to go to auctions with her as a kid. Uh, I used to ride my bike, bike to antique shops in Louisville, Kentucky, and this was before the Arrowhead. Um, so it was sort of, you know, I was getting back into that as a result of not writing my dissertation. Um, I discovered fairly quickly that I did, A, I didn't have any money to buy any antiques, but um, I was drawn to baskets of and boxes of old photographs that every antique dealer in the 1970s had in their shop. The antiques dealers didn't know what they were. You could buy them for 50 cents or a dollar. Uh, and I suddenly became uh, really, really fascinated in these old photographs. Not of people necessarily, but street scenes of Hudson, Ohio, or Ann Arbor, Michigan, or uh, San Francisco, California, or a picture of a Civil War soldier or an American Indian. And um, 
I, I discovered pretty quickly that there were other people like me who were interested in these things and uh, that in fact I could sell these things and make money. Uh, and I will never forget the day that I was in an antique shop in maybe Saline, Michigan, someplace like that, and I bought a photograph, uh, I, and there were a couple other guys in, in the antique shop who were eyeing me, uh, and they saw me buy this photograph, and one guy walks out of the shop after I'd paid for it and said, could I see your picture? And I said, sure. And he said, I'll give you $50 for it. And I just paid a dollar for it. <laughs> now, when you're in graduate school, that's a pretty good hit, right? So before long, I was buying and selling photographs. By the time I moved to Columbus, God knows why I moved to Columbus, Ohio, but it was, the, it was a job. Um, by the time I moved to Columbus and was teaching at Ohio State, I had a pretty nice little sideline business of selling photographs. Um, I stayed in Columbus for three years before I moved to Cincinnati, uh, took the hobby with me. Uh, developed the hobby and um, about uh, 20 years ago, 22 years ago, I got a call one day from my sister-in-law who's an attorney in Louisville, Kentucky and said, we have a problem at our firm. And I said, uh, you know, what, what, do you, what can I do for you? And she said, well, we have an estate here in Louisville that has a large collection of 19th century photography. We need to have it appraised and you know something about 19th century photography, so you're it. So I appraised this collection of 19th century photography. Uh, at the end of the appraisal, the uh, head lawyer of the firm said, well, thanks for the appraisal. Do you want to buy the collection? <laughs> and I said, well, I don't really think that ethically you would like me to be uh, appraise it and then buy it. But I have an idea. How about if you let me sell it at auction? I had already been buying and selling for, at this point, photographs for 10 years, and I was uh, particularly interested in stereo view cards, little 3D cards, and I was already holding mail and phone auctions of these little 3D cards. I put out a mimeographed list, no pictures, just a, a title, stereo view of Main Street, Hudson, Ohio, uh, and people would then submit bids to me. So to me, it was sort of a, a logical step. I liked the auction business, I liked photography, I had a collection, and I made a proposal to the firm and they said, there's only one heir, we're not talking about a lot of money, let me check it out. So they called the heir, she said, sure, that's fine. The attorney said, when can you do this auction? I said, well, there's only one problem, I don't have an auctioneer's license. <laughs> Gee, okay, how long is that gonna take? Well, I think I can do it pretty quickly because I can apprentice with a licensed auctioneer. Six weeks later, three months later, I had an auction. Uh, of this photography collection and uh, I hit the, um, the uptick in uh, the beginning of the uptick in the collecting of 19th century photography precisely at the right time. So after that sale which garnered a lot of publicity uh, I would come home from work at the museum uh, there'd be five messages on my answering machine when are you going to have your next auction because I have some things I want you to sell. Six months later, I had another auction, and then I'd come home from, the work, from work and there'd be 15 calls on my answering machine. And I said, you know, I feel like I've been an archeologist since I was in grade school, high school, all the way through college and into 11 years as a museum curator, time to do something else. So I left the museum uh, in 94 uh, and founded the uh, company that I have today. I can remember, how many people here um, ever had to call their parents and say, you know, either I lost my job or I'm leaving my job, uh, and this is a job that I could have stayed at for the rest of my life at the Museum of Natural History there. I can remember calling my mother and saying, Mom, and by the way, I have two children at this point. Uh, Mom, I'm leaving my job at the Museum of Natural History to become an auctioneer. <laughs> and God bless her, she's, you know what she said? She said, well, it's about time. <laughs> so I left the job, I launched my career, and I never looked back. Uh, along the way, my business grew very organically. Um, I sold historical photography and manuscripts and books and maps and anything that had to do with American history for about five years. And then I got a call from... Um, 
the estate of the um, former curator of decorative arts at the Cincinnati Art Museum. Do you sell, or in art, do you sell paintings, do you sell furniture? Well, not really, I was thinking, but I'll come out and take a look. So I went and looked at this estate, it was a fabulous estate, and I said, sure, I'll sell this stuff. Hired somebody who knew more than me about this kind of material, and away we went, selling furniture, paintings, decorative art, silver, da 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 da. About a year and a half later, the Western Reserve Historical Society in Cleveland, Ohio, uh, which at the time was going through a major period of deaccessioning things that really didn't have anything to do with Cleveland or the Western Reserve, they said, you know, we've got these literally closets of American Indian artifacts, and we're going to send them all to Christie's to sell. And I said, well, why would you do that? I have a PhD in anthropology. I know all about that stuff, sort of. Um, <laughs> made a proposal, had an American Indian art auction, it brought almost a million dollars. People came in from all over the country, uh, all the Midwestern collectors and dealers were saying, gee, you know, we don't have anybody in the Midwest selling American Indian art, why don't you sell American Indian art? Okay, great, I just almost had a million dollar auction, how hard can, how hard can this be? <laughs> so we added an American Indian art department. Uh, a few years later, uh, a gun shop closed. Uh, do you want to sell guns? Sure, I can sell guns. We sold guns. So now we have a firearms department. About five years ago, um, we were uh, having a, a sale of decorative arts, and uh, I noticed that we were selling a, 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 a large collection of ivory carvings from an insurance company in Tulsa, Oklahoma. And um, we'll get back to this, but all of a sudden, I was noticing that these things that we were estimating for a few hundred dollars, these ivory figures were selling for $5,000, $10,000, $20,000. Gee, we're going to have an Asian art auction, the next auction we're going to have. So at this point, we're a full-service auction house that sells just about anything, but we specialize still in American history, antique and historic militaria, American Indian art, Asian art, um, we also sell studio ceramics and modern art. And we do about almost $20 million worth of business a year. I have a staff of about 35 people, uh, each all these specialists um, um, that are in various, these various departments. Why did I, why did I, would I want to open a place up in Cleveland? Great, Cleveland is a great place. We've gotten so much business from Cleveland just organically over the past 15 or 20 years, it seemed to me that it was a good time to open a place in Cleveland. So we opened a place in Cleveland and we're doing very well and look forward to being here for a long, long time. Um, how did this all get me involved with History Detectives and with the Antiques Roadshow? Antiques Roadshow, easy. Um, not long after I started my business, I saw an a story in the Cincinnati Enquirer that said there's this new show that's going to be coming to Cincinnati uh, at the convention center called the Antiques Roadshow. Wow, they're going to you know be appraising antiques and people are going to bring in their things and I thought there might be an opportunity here for a local appraiser. So I got on the phone, called the producer at WGBH in Boston uh, who produces the Antiques Roadshow and said, look, I'm a local person, I can do this, this and this. Um, do you need an appraiser? The producer at the time said, come on down, we'll give you a, a, a lanyard with your name on it and we'll put you at the books and manuscripts table and you're in. So that was the second season of the Antiques Roadshow. Um, that was at a time when about maybe five or six hundred people would show up uh, at an Antiques Roadshow for an event. So uh, after that year, so I've been with the Antiques Roadshow just fortuitously, because I called and thought it might be a good idea, for uh, 17 of the 18 years that it's been on the on show, on the air. Antiques Roadshow, I'm sure, led directly to my involvement with history detectives. Um, I'd been on the Antiques Roadshow for seven or eight years. Um, I was came into work one day, typed, you know, look at my email inbox, and there's this in, there's this message. And I'm sure everybody's gotten weird messages. I got this really weird message that's asked me, would I be interested in being the 
presenter, not a host, a presenter of a new television show that was being produced. And I thought, oh, sure, this is a joke. So I typed it back, said, yeah, call me this afternoon. Let me know what you're going on. So I got a call that afternoon from an English voice uh, on the phone, very this disembodied young English woman uh, who told me about this show that uh, was going to be produced by, for PBS and it was going to be called America's Addict, or America's Attic, excuse me. <laughs> See, there you go. America's Attic. And uh, I said, okay, what's the premise? She said, well, can we send somebody down to film you uh, next week? I said, sure, come on down. So a 20-year-old, another 20-year-old English girl came down, filmed me in my warehouse. I was talking about a, you know, some antique. I can't even remember what it was. She left, and I didn't hear anything for about two months. I was driving to the Antiques Roadshow in Cleveland, the first time it was in Cleveland, when my phone rang, and yet a third English woman called me and said, we'd like to offer you the job of uh, being a presenter and I said, what's a presenter? She, oh, well, we call it a, you, you call it a host here in England. We call it a presenter. We'd like to offer you this job. And I said, well, yeah, I don't really know anything about the show. Don't you think that you should tell me a little bit more about it? She said, sure. Um, why don't you come to New York? Uh, the production office is in New York. Uh, when you get to LaGuardia, give me a call, and I'll give you the address. So I get to New York. I'll never forget this call his phone number the woman answers the phone, English woman answers the phone and she says you're gonna have to come to my apartment <laughs> and she heard the pause in my voice and she said no 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 it's not like that at all we we just don't have the office set up so I went to this office and I went to the apartment and there were other people there and uh, found out about the show uh, by that point they had decided that America's attic was not the, not the name that they were going to call it because it, precisely what I said, America's Addict, was what they thought people would hear. And they said, they told me at the time that this was going to be a show called History Detectives. So uh, I took the show, I took the job. Uh, that was 11 years ago. And um, I still to this day sort of wonder why they picked me. I know that they, they did a casting call from a bunch of people in the Antiques Roadshow. You know, the twins and the guy with the ponytail and you know. And I never considered, I never considered myself, you know, a, a star of the Antiques Roadshow. But what I finally did, I finally, as I analyzed this, I said, you know what? I think I know why they picked me. It's my hair color. <laughs> I appeal, they were thinking that I would appeal to PBS's core audience which is 60 and above. <laughs> so uh, anyway, History Detectives, uh, that's uh, History Detectives uh, for, how many people have seen History Detectives? Everybody I'm sure is, I, I don't even have to ask how many people have seen Antiques Roadshow. Everybody's seen a Antiques Roadshow. But I'm, I'm glad to see that a lot of people have seen History Detectives. Antiques Roadshow is going to continue on until, you know, who knows. Uh, History Detectives, um, it's a real toss-up whether the show is going to continue. For those of you who watched it this year, you saw four episodes all in July. As far as I know, uh, PBS has not made the decision to film any more History Detectives. They changed the format. Um, they shook the program up. They got rid of some of the ho excuse me, some of the hosts. Whether they're going to continue it or not, I don't know. The reason that they changed was that, as is so often the case, the PBS hired a new programmer, new program director, and when the new program director came on, the new programmer said, you know what, I'm going to put my stamp on History Detectives, and so that's the result. Um, I know that there will be a meeting in Washington at the end of this month, and they'll make a decision. It would not surprise me if they say no more History Detectives. Um, my wife has reminded me, though, for 11 years, I've said the same thing after every season. So who knows what's going to happen? Um, you know, um, for those of you who watch Antiques Roadshow, you'll know that History Detectives is, is a very different sort of program, totally different. It sort of 
follows in the, uh, uh, along from Antiques Roadshow, but people watch Antiques Roadshow for one reason. What's that? Who's, who's going to be the first one to tell me why people watch the Antiques Roadshow? Just raise your hand and I'm going to call in, or I'm going to, I'm going to point a finger. Why do people watch Antiques Roadshow? You in the, you in the shirt there, with the gray shirt on the aisle. Why do people watch Antiques Roadshow? They want to see prices. They want to see, I mean, that's good. Most people there, you know, people, oh, they want to learn about antiques. They want to, they don't want to learn any of that. They want to see somebody strike it rich, right? That's the whole premise. And that's when you watch the Antiques Roadshow, all the segments that are picked. Have you ever noticed that nobody's ever on with a $100 item or a $50 item? It's like Aunt Minnie's Tiffany lamp that's worth $100,000. It's guaranteed to put the owner in tears, right? That's what people want to see. That's the formula that PBS, the producers, have hit on with the Antiques Roadshow. If I told you, though, that 99% of everything that we see there is worth less than $100, would you believe it? Yeah because it is. There is no reward for me as an appraiser to pitch an interesting story of a $50 item because I know I'm not going to get taped. The way this works, how many people have actually participated in an Antiques Roadshow? A, a fair number of people here. So you know when you, when you go to the Antiques Roadshow with your thing, you go through a triage line where you open your bag up or your briefcase and somebody's looking at it and they're saying, oh, you have a piece of glass, here's a ticket to the glass table. Oh, you've got a painting, here's a ticket to the painting table. Then a volunteer will lead you to a particular table where you'll stand in an interminable line. <laughs> then you will uh, eventually get to the, excuse me, to the head of the line and there you're going to be facing a table with the appraiser, and the appraiser is going to look at your thing, and uh, they're going to tell you in about three minutes or less what it is. If the appraiser, who's sitting on the opposite side of the table from you and your thing, says uh, and spots something really great that might make good television, the appraiser then will flag down a producer, and the producer will come to the table, and the appraiser will take the producer aside and say, this woman over here, she's got a Tiffany lamp, and she thinks it was made last year. It's worth $100,000. <laughs> so then the producer will talk to the person. If the story is, uh, if, if the person really doesn't know anything about it or if it's an interesting story, the person's taken to the green room, and, a, and, the, and basically it, the filming occurs right there on the spot. There's no rehearsals. There's no time hardly for any research. What you see on television with the Antiques Roadshow is about as pure reality television as you can get. How many people watched uh, Pawn Stars, Storage Locker Wars, American Pickers? All of those shows are fake. They're fake. Do you think really someone would leave $100,000 in a storage locker? Or, or 5000 No way. They're all fake. The Antiques Roadshow is not fake. It's all pure. The other thing that probably most people don't realize is that the appraisers on the Antiques Roadshow are all there for, we, we don't get paid. We, in fact, pay our own way. So we're not financially remunerated, nor are we allowed to solicit any business. So if you've got that Tiffany lamp, I can't say, here's my business card. Call me after the show. So it's, ve it's very, very strict. I spend maybe $10,000 a year uh, flying and paying for expenses on Antiques Roadshow. Why in the world would I do that, right? Duh. <laughs> I get three minutes in front of 12 million people. If you multiply that over the five shows that I did this year, $10,000 versus what I'd have to pay to be on a network television set with viewed by less people would be a heck of a lot more. So all the appraisers are doing it for publicity for themselves and we occasionally do get contacted after the show by someone who brought something in to sell or something, something in to have it appraised. Doesn't happen very often though. I mean it really happens far less than you might anticipate. 
Most people who have something great know that it's great. They want to know how much it's worth so they can insure it often. They're, they have no intention of selling it. Um, that said, there are great stories of people who, uh, who have brought in things and then subsequently sold them for astronomical sums. But uh, more often than not, they're not interested in the money. History Detectives is a very different sort of show. And it taps into what I like to think, uh, and I think this is a great example of it, um, is America's love of history. You know, if there was a high school history teacher here, uh, they'd probably say, God, you know, I can't get my students interested in history. Um, but I think that History Detectives taps into a deep and rich vein of our love for history. It's not the kind of history, though, that we teach in high school or in our college survey courses. And that's the history that I call history with a big H. You know, the Pilgrim's Land, and then there's the French and Indian War, and the, so off to the Civil War, and then the next semester, Civil War through World War II. These big survey courses that cover American history with, this, with these broad brushes. History with a big H. That's what, we're not interested in history with a big H. We're interested in something far different, and I think that that's called history with a little h. How many people here have something in their house that was handed down to them by a relative that has a story attached to it? How many people here would consider themselves curators because of that artifact? Well, you are curating that family story. You're curating an item that belonged to your family, and that artifact, more often than not, connects your family with some big story in the history of our country. You've got a Civil War sword. Uncle Joe, great-great-grandpa Joe carried that in the 7th Ohio Cavalry. You've got a box of letters that your father wrote home from the World War II. You have a uh, ticket from the World's Fair in 1892. These, or you have a desk that was made right here in Hudson, Ohio by you know, your great-great-grandfather who was a carpenter and, oh, and by the way, he also made coffins. Those are the stories that we all like because they, were, they, they connect our family with the past. And that's what history detectives initially tapped into because we focused on all these stories that were focused on objects that people had in their house. Oh, you know, uh, I always wanted to find out about this abolition banner that my uncle found in the trunk and we've had in our family for 60 years. Uh, I have these bullets that supposedly were removed from the bodies of Bonnie and Clyde. Uh, and these are all true history detectives investigations. Um, but these are the kinds of things that all of us find interesting because we can put ourselves in that place. Not very many of us can put ourselves in the place of having a $100,000 Tiffany lamp. But if I did a story on the Civil War, how many people in this room, for history detectives, how many people in this room had some ancestor who participated north or south in the Civil War? Just raise your hands. <laughs> there you go. You're proving my point. These are all, that's why people liked history detectives, because they could identify with the stories. Because they had relatives that did the same thing. So when um, the uh, 100,000 or so fans of History Detectives found that on Facebook found out that History Detectives was changing the format, they didn't like it. And uh, for those of you who've watched the recent show who liked the old show, join the club. It's pretty overwhelming. I would say maybe 75, 60, 40. Most people like the old format. Why? Because they could identify with it, with the stories more, more uh, uh, better. So uh, I've been very privileged to be associated with uh, history detectives, gotten to go places and do things that um, 
people have that I would never do otherwise. Uh, work on stories that are just uh, mind blowing. I don't know if anybody saw the uh, story a couple years ago when we actually returned a North Vietnamese soldier's diary to his family in North Vietnam, where it had been retrieved by a uh, Marine. Uh, in 1967 from a, a dead North Vietnamese soldier. It haunted this guy for 50 years. He knew he shouldn't have taken this thing, and he, he was poisoned by Agent Orange. By the time we met him, he was dying. Uh, he wanted to get this diary back, and I'm getting goosebumps even talking about this. Remember when uh, our Secretary of Defense went over to North Vietnam and ex got letters from uh, the North Vietnamese governor, government from a, um, from a US POW. We gave him the diary and he gave it back to the North Vietnamese government who then returned it to the family. Uh, and it was just an amazing story. That's probably the highlight of uh, the 11 years of the show for me, but a great story. Um, but whether it, re whether it continues or not, I don't know. Can't tell you, uh, I had a good run with it and i um, happy that I was able to do it. I want to switch gears now and leave, leave us plenty of time to uh, uh, take questions. How many people here uh, collect antiques? Good number of people. How many, I didn't say, didn't say how many people of us are antiques. I said how many people collect antiques. Well, for those of you who do uh, and follow the market closely, you'll know that uh, the market has changed remarkably in the last uh, few years. Last 10 or so years in particular, as the internet has aggregated more and more product in one place. Uh, for those who, of you who are longtime antique uh, collectors, you'll know that in the 1960s and, or 1970s and 80s, 90s, the only way you could find out about auctions and that sort of thing was to get a trade paper that you read every week. And if you went to a, if you saw an auction that was in uh, Barberton, you'd drive to Barberton because you collected RS Prussia or whatever. Well, once the internet really started to take off, it changed that because all auctions started to be listed on the internet, uh, particularly with eBay. Uh, everybody was able to become an auctioneer. Everybody went up into their attic, put stuff on the market uh, through eBay. And uh, what happened was that the world discovered, the world of collectors anyway, discovered that uh, something that, that they had, had forgotten. And that is that the average antique, the things that we as Americans call antiques, the average antique was made in the late 19th century in factories and was shipped all over by railroad cars to feed a growing middle class market. And so what eBay did initially was to flood the market with all these average antiques. They weren't average before eBay because the only way you could find them was to go to an auction and read about it in a trade publication. So the market, the first shake out of the market was through eBay. The market has continued to shake out as tastes have changed and people who like to collect cut glass in Limoges, China and Haviland, China started to get older and older, and lo and behold, they found out that nobody wants Haviland China anymore. Why? Why don't people want Haviland China? Anybody got an idea? Somebody said you can't put it in the microwave. You probably could put it in the microwave <laughs> unless, it has, unless it has a gold rim, and then you're gonna see it go ch -ch -ch -ch. But more importantly, you can't put it in the dishwasher because all those Haviland decorations or decals, and they'll melt when you put them in a dishwasher. They'll wash off. So the only way you can do it is wash it by hand. When was the last time anybody washed their Thanksgiving dinner dishes by hand? There are a few diehards here, but do your children want to do that? Yeah, she says, yeah, you got weird kids. <laughs> but, but seriously, tastes have changed. And tastes have left a lot of antique, changing tastes have left a lot of antiques behind. So now the market is 
separated into the top 15 or 20 percent of really truly great things really truly great things and then there's everything else and most of us were never fortunate enough to be able to collect truly great things because those truly great things even 30 40 years ago cost a lot of money we collected nice things but not truly great things. Well, guess what? The nice things nobody wants because there's too much of it and tastes have changed and there's nobody coming up that's interested in collecting that stuff. But the truly great things, the top 10, 15%, there are more buyers for those truly great things than there is product. And so when you read in the newspaper about these astronomical prices that are being paid for things, Keep in mind, that's the top 10%. One of the biggest problems that I have as an auctioneer and my staff of people that are making house calls and talking to people and securing property, one of the biggest things we do now is managing people's expectations. You know, I paid $2,000 for that 20 years ago. Gee, Mrs. Smith, I'm sorry, but you know, it, it really today, it, it's worth 500. Oh, well, I'm just going to keep that if it's only worth 500 and then you get the call the next day and they say, well, you know what? What am I going to do with it? Come and get it. So the internet has been a boon and a, bu a boon for people that collect antiques because it's aggregated so much stuff in one place and you don't have to go to Barberton anymore. You can sit in your pajamas and search the internet. Our auctions are all held live in real time on the internet. So you can sit and watch your computer screen, see the, the piece, the object that we're selling, and all you have to do is put your mouse on a button that says bid. And you click it and your bid is instantly recorded. And if you're the successful bidder, we send you an invoice, we ship it to you, and you never had to leave your house. A lot of people don't like that. A lot of people say it's taken the, taken the fun out of collecting antiques, but it has revolutionized the auction business uh, in good ways and bad ways. The other thing that's happened in the past few years, uh, which is truly remarkable, and I alluded to this um, earlier, was the rise of the Asian market, the rise of the Chinese bidder. Um, seven eight years ago we used to get a few people from Asia who found our website um, and would submit bids with the aggregation of auctions on live bidding platforms where you might have a hundred auctions at once um, Asian bidders suddenly found a way uh, suddenly found a window open into the Asian art market in the US that they had no idea existed and my first inkling of that was, as I said, about five or six years ago when we were selling the Asian ivory. Uh, and it was, it was phenomenal. Probably had a group about this big uh, at the sale, uh, and everybody is looking over at the computer where I have uh, you know, people taking bids, and the guy just keeps saying, bid, bid, where he's taking an automatic bid from an Asian buyer. Today we do two Asian auctions a year. Um, they average, you know, maybe five, six hundred thousand dollars each, and it's starting to fall off. Um, but it's a market that's an enormous market. It's also a market that's rife with big problems. Chinese bidders don't understand. They're starting to get the picture, but initially they didn't understand when you bid in an auction, that's a contractual agreement to pay for something. <laughs> So um, the biggest horror story that I can tell you is a story that involves a, um, a vase, uh, an imperial vase um, that was appeared at a regional auction house in England that the auctioneer knew it was pretty good. And uh, you know, they had it estimated maybe 50, 60,000 pounds, whatever that is in dollars. Um, they had it on the internet. The day of the auction, um, all of a sudden, they're seeing the price continue to go up and up and up. When the hammer fell, it sold for about $30 million. $30 million. 
great. I mean, if I was an auctioneer and I had just sold something for $30 million and they were probably getting 20% commission, I'd be tempted to retire, right? <laughs> Problem was, <laughs> the Asian buyer said, I'm not paying for it. And I don't think that it was ever, that it was ever settled. Uh, we have, um, uh, have had the same problems. We have this problem in every sale we have between 10 to as high as 15 or 20 percent of all the transactions that are conducted with someone in mainland China never get completed. Never get completed. So we're very careful to tell our consignors to the sale, you know, people who say, would you like to sell my jade, my uh, Ming vase, whatever, we'd love to, but you should know that there's a problem. And there are no collection agencies in Beijing. Uh, there's very little that we can do. We asked for national identity cards uh, for a long time, and uh, the Asian bidders figured out a way to get around the national identity card. It's a problem that every auction house, including Sotheby's, Christie's, any big auction house will tell you it's an issue. But what has happened with the Asian market, Asian market has started to cool off. Um, the Asian buyers initially were buying anything. They, they just couldn't believe that all this stuff was out there. They become much more sophisticated and the wheat is starting to separate out from the, from the chaff in terms of the kinds of product that's being offered by auction houses and the bidders are becoming more sophisticated. So they're, 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 they recognize more and more that, you know what, you, you, we, we, if we're buying this, we have to pay for it. So. Um, with that, I know that I've talked at least 35 or 40 minutes, probably longer than that. Uh, I want to stop and uh, open the floor up for questions. Any questions, Antiques Roadshow, History Detectives, uh, the auction business, the art world, whatever you want to do. Uh, I saw him first. On, uh, on the uh, Antiques Roadshow, an item gets to an appraiser. The appraiser, I feel looking at it, knows that it's not what the person who brought it to the Antique Roadshow believes it is. In fact, it may be a reproduction or an absolute fake, but they seem to be so skilled at letting that person down. Do you somehow train these sellers? <laughs> I mean, these appraisers to let the people down easy? I do that every day in my business. I'm sorry it's not what you think it is, or I'm sorry it's not worth that. No, they, there's, look, most of the people that are, are not most of them, all the people on the Antiques Roadshow have been in the business a long time. All of them are at the top of their game. All of them have seen these, these issues before. Yeah, and you know, you, you, you obviously, you, the, the, one of the biggest problems that I have is dealing with somebody who says, this has been in our family for 150 years. It's my, this was my great grandmother's, they, you know, they brought it over on the Mayflower. <laughs> and I remember, real, not, that, not that crazy, but you know, that it's, that it's older than, than, than they, they think it's older than you know it is. My favorite story with that was that the, somebody had a, a print, one, a yard long print. Anybody know what a yard long, you know, one of these long lithographs that typically would hang in somebody's kitchen, you know, fruit or flowers. So these people, brought, this whole family came up and says, this was, you know, been in our family for 200 years. You know, really, it, it's, you know, no, it, it's beautiful, it's got a great sentimental, I know you'd never sell it, but it's really not as, oh no! My mother told me, and her mother told her, and her, you know, on and on, and said, well, look over in the left-hand corner of the print. Copyright, 1911. <laughs> so they were very humbled. Some people get mad. Some people say you don't know what you're talking about, um, and that happens, you know. And and we just say, that's my opinion. Uh, your, your here's your opinion. That's great. It's great now that, that we have the uh, wireless internet connection at the roadshow because you can then get online and say, you know, your rare thing. Just go on eBay, and here's 50 other ones just like it. And it's worth $10. So th that's, that's a good thing. 
One of the things that, um, and we're all human on the Antiques Roadshow. Nobody's perfect. One of the things that we're uh, admonished every, before every uh, roadshow, there's a meeting of the appraisers with the producers. And <laughs> a couple years ago, the, the, this, this came out, and now, of course, it's a standing joke among the appraisers. The producer of the show was getting, had gotten some complaints that the appraiser uh, you know, just looked at the object, knew what it was, never really picked it up, and never, you know, showed that they were really paying attention to it. So our mantra now is, touch the object. <laughs> so this next year, I'm going to have printed at the beginning of the season a t-shirt that says, please touch my object. <laughs> and they'll go out to every appraiser. So other questions? Yeah, you were next, so. Yeah, well, how do you uh, establish the value? Question was, how do we establish value uh, of anything that we sell? Well, you know, most of the things that we see on the Antiques Roadshow are not absolutely unique. There are auction records uh, that we can consult. There's, there's encyclopedias that we walk around with in our head. Uh, in my case, as an auctioneer, where we sell, my company sells, 15,000 lots, 15,000 things a year. You know, you, you see a lot of things over the course of your career. So um, established uh, auction sales records is one way, and then just knowledge, just personal knowledge. For you, the toughest thing, though, are for items that truly are one of a kind. How do you appraise something that is absolutely unique that there's only one example of. Um, great example of that, uh, which would be, which should be near and dear to everyone here from Hudson. A few years ago, uh, I was contacted by a uh, appraiser in Northern California who had, was participating in an appraisal fair at a library, you know, much like this. People bring in their things and, you know, the appraiser looks at them and, says it's a, you know, a lamp, it's worth $25. One woman walks in, puts this uh, photograph, a cased photograph uh, on the table, uh, opens it up, and it's a daguerreotype of John Brown. The woman who brought it in was John Brown's great, great granddaughter. The daguerreotype had stayed in, the Brown, in John Brown's family, passing along to the oldest female heir um, when she got married. She wanted to know what this thing was worth. She, they were having a crisis in the family. The grand, one of their grandchildren needed major surgery. So the guy said, there's only one guy you should call. It's called Wes Cowan because I'm a, you know, had sold all these historical photographs. So it was sent to me, what's it worth? What's it worth? How do you, how do you value it? There are five other photographs of, five other photographs known of John Brown. This was one that was in the family. So, you know, you have to sort of say, well, if it were this, and, it, and you just sort of pull a number out of the air. It, it ended up selling for close to $100,000 uh, to the Nelson Atkins Museum in Kansas City. So it's in a museum now. But for unique things, you don't know. You just don't know. You have to sort of fly by the seat of your pants. Other questions? Uh, yes, and the, the lady in the black blouse. Yeah, that's you. You're wearing a black blouse. <laughs> Oh, it's blue. Now I see. Sorry. We, uh, my husband and I are a huge fan of history detectives and, and of course, of Antiques Roadshow. And um, so my question is, um, how long does it take to produce a show, a, a, a segment like the one that you did on uh, the North Vietnamese piece? Um, on the which one? The, the, the diary. The diary. Okay. Yeah. Like, how long does it take? Because, of course... It appears on the show as though it's just easy and it's just happening in a matter so, of it's a few so days. Easy. <laughs> yeah. So, so the the question was, how long does it produce a? How long does it take to produce a segment, uh, a seventeen minute segment uh, on history detectives, which the old history detectives? The answer is about to produce it between six and eight weeks per segment. To film it about a week. Then it's edited, 
uh, and then uh, it is airs. Typically, we would film, start filming in November, and the whole season would be filmed between November and June. So I could count on being away from my office for about a week at a time. Uh, and I will tell you that, uh, and I, I, if there are people who would be disappointed by this, so be it. I do not do any, zero of the research for history detectives. I wouldn't know, you know what, from Shinola before I get a script. Uh, look, at here's his voice. It's terribly disappointed. I'm sorry, I told you. How could I possibly be doing all that research and run a business that I run and it, with 35 employees doing close to $20 million worth of business here and be running all over to libraries and doing research and, you know. I'm just, uh, my nickname uh, among the crew, uh, the, the various crews that films history detectives is, just tell me what you want me to say, Wes. <laughs> Now, that, I, I don't mean it's that bad because, listen, this, the show is very fluid, very organic, uh, and because I am a pretty naturally curious guy, we get into a library and, and the producers say, read this segment on page 23. Well, while the camera's setting up and, you know, they're getting the sound guys, I'm flipping through, and, and more often than not, I'll find something on page 19 that they didn't see. And I'll say, wait a minute, you guys didn't see this. We need to, so they have to sort of re-script on the fly. A lot of it is done on the fly, and there's no real script. I don't want to memorize any lines. I mean, anybody could probably, I hope you could tell me, tell that I don't memorize any lines. Um, but it's, it's uh, the, the researchers do most of the research, and we just show up. Okay? Uh, yes? Go ahead. I don't care who... who, who What's your definition of fine art? Uh, sculptures, paintings. The question he, the question the gentleman wanted to know was, what's the fine art market looking like today? The fine art market is, remember, uh, it's no different than the rest of the antique market. If you uh, collect European paintings, for example, the average European painting nobody wants. 19th century Victorian European Scottish painting of, you know, sheep or, sheep or uh, steers on a lock. Who cares? <laughs> if it's the best one that, if it's the best Scottish artist, then they, they sell well. Uh, American paintings the same way. American regional paintings have fallen off dramatically. Um, from the, particularly the Victorian era. 20th century, a different story. Uh, paintings from the 30s, 40s, 50s up in today, uh, 30s and 40s and 50s in particular, uh, have become really strong. But if it's a Victorian painting, forget it. Nobody wants it. If you have two paintings hanging in your house of the Hudson, like the Hudson's, the folk art paintings in the back, they're still great. It's, it, it, there are great areas within all of these categories, but it has to be at the top. Otherwise, it's just stuff. I fight this constantly with my people that are taking in product. When you bring in your painting, and these guys are looking at auction records um, for, a, for a painter, and, and they see that in 2010, this painting sold for $1,000, and they estimated it at $1,000. It's not worth $1,000 today. It's worth 800 or 600 So I'm constantly saying, be careful, don't overestimate the value of these things because as an auctioneer, um, there's one reason people go to auctions, right? They think they're gonna get a bargain. So we walk a delicate line all the time between the estimates that we place on property uh, because we want to attract people to bid on that property. And I can assure you, has anybody ever put property in an auction before? So a few people, I can assure you, and there have been numerous studies to, to back this up, that the lower the entry point for bidding, the more bidding you will get and the higher the end result will be. 
the lower the entry barrier, the higher the end result will be. And believe me, it's a struggle all the time with people who own property when you say, well, we would like to estimate it $100. I paid $400 for it, you know, estimated at $100. And it might bring $300. But uh, it's, a, it's a constant struggle. But the market for fine and decorative arts, it's the same as the rest of the market. The, the, um, the sort of interesting dynamic that um, probably most of us don't participate, I certainly don't participate in it, is the modern art market, and particularly living modern artists, where uh, a guy can paint a painting and six weeks later he'll put it in a Christie's or Sotheby's auction and it'll bring a half a million or a million dollars. That's a, that's a horse of a different color, totally different. And that's not what we normally, that's not what we normally deal with. Other questions? Yes, sir. Is there a, a fixed percentage that you apply to go from retail to auction to uh, uh, insurance value? Typically, insurance, uh, it, it, a, a lot of appraisers will tell you insurance, the insurance value is about maybe 30, 40% over retail value. So for me, as an auctioneer, I don't deal in retail values. By and large, there's some things that we, uh, in, in fact, a lot of things that we end up selling, sell to the end user, sells for a retail price. Uh, why? Because we market the dickens out of this stuff, and a lot of the people that we deal with are collectors. They're not dealers, they're collectors. And when I have um, an item and I have 15 people on the telephone bidding for it, I know that good things are going to happen, that there are dealers and collectors bidding on it, and the collector's always going to bid higher than the dealer, and if I have three collectors bidding on it, it's going to sell for retail money. So, um, but in general, insurance is always higher than retail, auction estimate is lower, okay? Uh, let me get somebody in the back of the room, yes, in the, way in the back row. Do I have a holy grail? Yes, I do have a holy grail. And I actually talked about this on the Antiques Roadshow about, I don't know, 10 years ago. Um, during the California Gold Rush, there was a, a San Francisco daguerreotypist who went into the gold fields and made about 200 daguerreotypes of gold mines and miners and mining camps. Uh, and these were, uh, for those of you who know what a daguerreotype is, um, the, uh, the standard daguerreotype plate size is about six by eight inches. Photographers then would cut the daguerreotype plate up to make smaller images. So there was a ninth plate, which would be a ninth of a six by eight plate, a sixth plate, which is the more common one, quarter plate, half plate, whole plate, which is the six by eight plate size. This daguerreotypist made about 200 whole plate daguerreotypes. That's the most expensive daguerreotype that you could find. Um, I sold one uh, a few years ago that was found in a, a historical society in Philadelphia, um, not from, from the same photographer, but not part of this series, of a San Francisco scene, and it sold for $100,000. So there are 200 of these that we know existed. He took them to New York, mounted them in these beautiful rosewood frames, had an exhibit, advertised this big exhibit. He thought he was going to make you know, a lot of money because it was right during the California gold rush. He thought he'd get New Yorkers flocking to see scenes from the gold rush, and nobody came. Nobody came. He lost his shorts. The daguerreotypes then passed through a number of hands before they ended up with a photographer in St. Louis in the 1860s. That's the last that we know about this daguerreotype collection, which today would probably be worth 20 or 30 million dollars. So nobody knows where it is. It's probably, um, probably long gone. But that's my holy grail. There's a trunk in St. Louis somewhere <laughs> in somebody's <laughs> attic that has all, has all these things. Uh, and that would be my, my Chinese vase, except I'd get it paid for. 
Yes, in the blue shirt. Sure. The twins are good at that yeah. on the road show. What maintenance should we provide to these guardrails that are so maintain Well, the first thing I say about furniture is uh, if you have a piece of furniture that was made in a factory, you can do anything you want to to it. Uh, with with a few exceptions, but um, I make the distinction between furniture that was made by, in small numbers by a local craftsman, and I'll guarantee you Hudson had cabinet makers, uh, versus a oak dining room table that you would buy in a department store in the 1890s when everything was being made in a factory. And the, and the break is really the Industrial Revolution. Industrial Revolution revolutionized all industries, particularly the furniture industry. So if you have a piece of furniture from the 1840s, 1830s, I wouldn't touch it. You know, just use wax, but I wouldn't refinish it. If you've got a, a dining room table that was painted white, <laughs> that, or you want to paint it white, <laughs> feel free. It was made after, you know, it was made during the Industrial Revolution because it's, it's unlikely that it will ever increase significantly in value because there were too many of them made. You know, the other thing I can tell you is um, the internet today is the easiest source to get information. How do I take care of my antique table? You know, just Google that and you're going to get an information. Who can refin who can rebind my book in Cleveland? You're going to get a book binder in Cleveland. The internet's the first place to start. Um, if there's a great antique dealer here in uh, Hudson, person that's been around for a long time, they're often a good place to start to ask for their advice. Other questions? Yes. Uh, for those of us who love uh, history detectors, and I know there's going to be a lot, what can we do to ensure that it doesn't take a job? You know, uh, I, I would say that um, you could email probably the ombudsman or somebody like that at PBS, or um, because I don't know. I really don't know, and if I, uh, my guess is that if I gave, if I did know who to send your, in an email to, and they started getting thousands of emails, they'd probably be really PO'd <laughs> at me. Yes, in the back. Boy, you ask a really hard question. The question that for those of you in the front who didn't hear was, you know, who's a good authenticator of autographs? Um, you know, the best way to start with autographs is to have a comparable. Is to have a, you know, I got an Abraham Lincoln signature. Here's another one. Here and here's another one. And here's another one. Um, real forensic document examiners. Um, spend a lot of time looking at autographs under a microscope, uh, you know, that you can hook up to your computer. And it's amazing what you can see. And you can buy these little fairly cheap magnifiers that will show you when somebody picked their pen up, for example. You know, the, 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 the autograph forger typically is not really a very good forger they're trying to trace an autograph. And they're not, when, when we write our signature, we write it like this. Somebody who's forging an autograph often can't do that. And so they will write a little bit, and then they're saying, well, let's see, I gotta go over this way. So they'll pick their pen up, and you can see this when you magnify their signature. Who I would get to, uh, I, I mean, I, I don't really have anyone that I use that I would trust. Um, the names that you mentioned uh, that are primarily sports collectors guys, they have been all over the news recently 
for, for authenticating Xerox signatures. Uh, for uh, authenticating a Babe Ruth signed baseball that was, the baseball was made after Babe Ruth died. <laughs> Wherever there's money to be made, there are people that are making fakes. There was a very good faker of Abraham Lincoln documents uh, from Northern Ohio, who when I first started working got fooled by. And um, you know, I don't know if he's still alive or not, but he's, he's really tough to, to figure it out. But if you look carefully, you'll see most of them, they, they don't write in a smooth hand. It's all over eBay. It's all over eBay. I would not be collecting signed baseballs if my life depended on it, unless, unless I had a picture of me standing there with Babe Ruth and giving me the ball. A uh, couple more questions and then we'll, uh, and yes, yes ma'am. What's hot in the antique collecting world? Well, um, how many people started their house, uh, their household, their lives, their married lives in the 1950s, 1960s? Mid-century modern is one of the hottest areas that um, we can point to in the contemporary antique market. You know, a dining room, uh, an Eero, Saren, and table from 1965, that's hot, that's collectible. Cleveland School ceramics, Cleveland School artists from the 40s and the 50s, those, are, for people around here, uh, those are very hot. Um, the antique world, though, has a, there's a, there's a real cycle to these markets. Um, and typically, they're often driven first by young people who um, become attracted to something, it's cheap, they can buy it for their house or their apartment, and then people like me discover it, and they start driving the prices up, and the young people are driven out, and the young people then move on to something else. The perfect example of that is arts, the arts and crafts movement. 20 years ago, the arts and crafts movement was so red hot, um, that you know you could put up a Gustav Stickley sideboard and it was going to bring five thousand dollars no matter what kind of Gustav Stickley sideboard it is. That market has matured and it's really changed as people have become much more interested in modern furniture, mid-century modern, 60s, 50s, 60s, 70s, and that movement that it really stretches back into the 20s. But even that market which was again um, was popular initially with people in their 20s and 30s, now it's become dominated by people in their 50s and 60s and have driven the price up for everything. So it, it, the antique world and collectible world is always cyclical, cyclical and we're, we're in the middle of a modernism cycle right now. Whether, uh, if anybody here collected uh, Hawks uh, cut glass bowls, whether that market's going to ever come back or not, I don't know. Who knows? If I had a crystal ball, and that's one of the common questions that I ask, what, would, what should we be collecting? God, if I knew that, I, would be, I wouldn't be here talking to you guys. I'd, have, I'd be filling my warehouse up with that stuff. But I don't know the answer to that. Last question, make it a good one. Yes. On the Haitian market, when they don't pay for what they did, what does the process look like? Do you put it up again for sale? Yeah we put it up again for sale, or we can return it to the consigner. But it's, it's about 10, 15%. Just doesn't happen. Doesn't happen. Thank you very much for uh, having me here tonight. It was great. Um, I, I hope that some of you guys will come over and visit us uh, uh, in Warrensville on Miles Road. Love to see you there. Thanks again. Also, you can join us for some refreshments in the back.